Welcome everyone to our third MAO panel discussion live. I'm Tammy McCullough, owner and founder of Mosaic Arts Online. It is so great to have so many of you back for our third panel and many of you just joining us for the first time. So thank you for being here. It's so wonderful to have you all here, a part of our online community and be able to engage with you while we're all staying home safely. And hopefully everyone in your world is healthy as well. If you did not get a chance to see our other two MAO panels or the follow-up questions, you can find them here on our YouTube channel. And don't forget to subscribe. One is on color and the other on design and composition. But today's topic is materials, meaning and manipulation. And we have with us three incredibly talented and accomplished artists, Kelly Knickerbocker, Julie Sperling, and Caitlin Hepworth. Each of these artists are also award-winning, have shown their work all over the world and have created many custom commissions in their careers. They've also been recognized with awards and scholarships through the Society of American Mosaic Artists, also known as SAMA, and are all active members and would have been presenters and instructors at our conference next week. Sad emoji. As of the president of SAMA, I'm sad we can't be together in Tucson, but I am thrilled we have found ways like this to come together, engage, and share with you these artists and their experiences. I'm very excited about this panel. Mm -hmm. And there is so much to cover that we are really just going to dive right into the questions as we get started. So in doing that, I have Kelly Knickerbocker, and the first question goes to you, Kelly. When you incorporate ephemeral materials such as wood and paper into your work, how important a consideration is durability? Do you take special measures to make these materials more durable? Yes. Um, well, first, let me just say my name is Kelly Knickerbocker, and I'm, my studio is in Seattle. Um, it's pouring rain out right now, um, as you might expect. Um, I've been doing mosaic for 15 years, basically self taught although I continue to add to my skill set by, of course, doing many, many hours a day and also taking workshops from uh, all kinds of people all over the world. Um, so anyway, this is what I live, eat and breathe. And um, materials are my jam. I, I love materials. And so I'm really, really happy to be here. Thank you, Tammy, for uh, inviting me in and letting me speak with my good friends and uh, colleagues here. Yes, um, thank you. So to the short answer, the technical answer is, uh, sure, I think about their vulnerability, these ephemeral materials. And I look for, you know, your basic uh, material appropriate sealers and fixatives to protect them as best I can. But the larger answer to that is I use ephemeral materials often precisely because they are fragile and transient and will eventually go away no matter what I do to them. Um, that's kind of the point for me. Um, and there's several reasons for that for me. One is that they are, um, in my thinking, a representation of humanity's vulnerability and the, the human experience. It's transient. It's not going to last forever. Um, and these natural uh, materials, um, uh, you know, up against the durable materials, stone, glass, uh, ceramic, uh, that are going to be around uh, long after we're gone. Um, I, I love that that juxtaposition and that contrast, and I feel like it's really important. And it also makes those durable materials more more of what they are. You know, they be they become more um, hard and resistant, and stop your eye right there, and no give to them. Um, so both kinds of materials are um, enhanced by being together. Um, I also think that uh, ephemeral materials are a necessary and important um, expansion of the definition of mosaic, which has always been a hard material medium. And of course, in architectural and functional mosaics, um, you can't have ephemeral materials. But in fine art mosaic, um, which is mainly what I'm doing, um, I have the luxury to um, to use fragile and transient materials and um, basically tesserize anything I want um, and use it to, um, to illustrate the story that I'm telling. Um, so I want to show you, um, I'm 
practiced this, so I think I can do it successfully. I want to show you a couple of images <laughs> of uh, my mosaics, uh, a couple of them that have used uh, paper uh, and wood, and uh, let you sort of look at those. Um, okay, cross your fingers, count to three. Is that it? Yes. Yay! Got it. Perfect. Is it full screen? It's beautiful. Absolutely. Beautiful. Excellent. Okay, so um, the paper there, it's, it's, uh, it's paper towels, and it's crucial to me that this, um, that this material is up against the hard material, granite, in the first slide, the first image. There's a lot of granite there, which is the polar opposite of paper towels. And in the second image, there are other hard materials, common use materials, dishes, things like that, uh, glass fragments, um, and there's gold throughout because the idea of this particular series was that um, it was called of value and it was uh, addressing the value that we place on various materials. Why is gold the most valuable thing? Why are paper towels the least valuable thing, right? They're made to be garbage, basically. They're made to be used up. Um, and so juxtaposing those felt really important to me, um, you know, because that uh, we need to look at that. Uh, I love looking at those kind of comparisons. And then uh, this, um, these two pieces were uh, companion pieces that I built out of twigs, um, a chain that I found in the middle of an intersection that had been run Kelly, over. Kelly, those, you, you haven't switched slides yet. Go to your next How slide. Why not? Oh my gosh, no. What, tell me, no. We're, all, we're still on the towels. Oh no, okay. Hang on, uh, oh man, oh, I thought we had this. We did. Hold on, how about that? Yes. Yay. Okay. okay, so this is made up of basically garbage of all kinds mixed with stained glass. And um, so it's just garbage from the studio process, things that have been run over in the street, twigs that have fallen off trees, um, found, just found objects, all kinds of um, discarded things. Um, and some of them are ephemeral because, you know, um, that's just how it is. And so um, putting those together with the hard materials and also, again, just pointing out um, that there's beauty in garbage. There's beauty in everything. There's beauty in the, the remnants, the, uh, the leftovers, the, the garbage of other processes. Um, and there you go. So I'm going to see if I can get out of this image thing. Um, Practicing what we you're, said. You're here. We see you. Are we back? You're yeah. back. I see you. you. Now too. Those are so great that's visuals. Kind of my, that's kind of my large answer to that question that, yes, I understand the, I take that into consideration, but really that's why I'm using the material. So I know they're going to go away and that's just how it is. And Julie, you and Caitlin both have had other experiences as well, kind of with the ephemeral sort of materials. And you want to talk about those a little bit of what you guys have used? Sure, I can go. I I will admit <laughs> that I, I think I've been a little bit reluctant to kind of uh, dive into the ephemeral and fragile materials just because of what we're taught kind of when you're starting out, you know, it has to, it has to endure. And so I've only started exploring this and I have used some more fragile than ephemeral um, pieces. So things like uh, I did a piece on ocean acidification and I actually degraded my own shells and some of them came out to be pretty much paper thin. And so I put those in, I tried to protect them as much as I can, um, but knowing the risk and knowing that if part of them chips off, if they keep on kind of disintegrating just within with their contact with the atmosphere, that's part of the story. That's part of that fragility of our oceans and what we're doing to them. So, you know, if I use them, I use them intentionally. They contribute to the story that I'm telling. Um, and, you know, I'm pretty confident that whatever I build, you know, it'll be it'll be there for the kind of the lifetime of whoever buys it. But will it be there three, four, five generations later? I don't know. I don't particularly trouble myself with that. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm more interested in, you know, the stories that the piece and its evolution, however it might evolve over, over time, what what kind of 
conversations that sparks within you know the family that buys it and the you know the the way it changes their lives and what they pass along that way rather than will someone's great 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 grandchild inherit the exact same piece yeah. that I originally produced so that's my well, short answer <laughs> no it's good and it's interesting because I've seen live and it was in 2012 Kelly's paper towels mosaics and when you were just first starting them have they degraded do you nope. still have any of them? So oh, yeah. yep, I'm looking at one right now up on the wall. No, nope, yeah, the same. It's you a may bit never know. Best, but <laughs> and Caitlin, what about your process using some ephemeral materials? I don't tend to use a lot of ephemeral materials, but I do use materials that have been affected or changed in in some way. Um, so I've used a lot of fire salvage materials, in which case the glass has melted. It is slumped. Often, one piece of glass may have fused slightly with another piece of glass. Now, in terms of fusing, they're not technically meant to go together, those two pieces. So, the COEs are different, the materials are different. But what I do get is a beautiful mix of color and texture. And then I can use that then in a mosaic. And a bit later, I'll show you some examples of that. But there's a fragility there. So, if something's been affected by extreme heat, it can crack, it can crumble. And uh, that's okay because uh, it's the authenticity of that material, the story of the material, the provenance of that material that I'm interested in. And that's why I've chosen to include it. And I've included it intentionally and carefully. And I might have other materials around it which are perhaps more robust, but they, as Kelly said, you know, they support each other. And then using those mix, mixed materials, that, as, as Kelly's just illustrated, so she's got paper towels and she's got sticks and she's got stones, she manages to bring them together so beautifully because of her for her other understanding of color and design so all these mixed media can come together and be beautifully integrated um, because there's considerations of texture there's considerations of color and there's considerations of value and even though those materials might be something like a paper towel or in my case um, a fragile piece of glass they can be successfully integrated if we consider the basic elements and principles of, of art and design yes right and i mean this the whole topic of today is meaning and manipulation and it's what you guys do so well is you're really manipulating some of the most unconventional materials in mosaic art and that's pretty i think amazing as an artist to experiment and um you guys are really good at teaching that as well in your courses because you each do come with these different ways and materials to use to create something pretty um spectacular each time and kick us yet creativity through constraint and sculptural mosaics, all three, hands down, some of the best uh, materials we have for our online courses as well. All right, so we're gonna pop on to Julie Sperling now, and you might be, and uh, Julie, when designing one of your pieces, what takes primacy, texture, color, or meaning? So, okay, so first of all, hi, uh, coming to you from Kitchener, Ontario, Canada, um, and I've been, I would say doing this seriously for about six or seven years, but tinkered a lot before then, uh, especially with stained glass. And so materials for me are really kind of central to how I do my work, but they're also central to my identity as a mosaic artist. Um, so before when I was doing stained glass, it, it, like it just never felt right. And as soon as I found the material that I loved and how I liked to work with it and what I wanted to say with it. Like that's when I really started to figure out who I was as an artist. So, so those materials are central to my story too, not just the stories I'm telling. Anyway, um, the question is like central to my whole artistic practice. Um, so for me, I, it's always what a material can bring in terms of helping me tell the story that I'm telling. And those stories almost, exclusively are about climate change and the Anthropocene. So basically environmental doom and gloom. Um, so yeah, sometimes it's the color, sometimes the texture, but it's not just the color in that it's, I'm gonna use blue because I like blue. Um, it's what is it bringing to the story? So I've got an example here, hold on. We did practice this. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. It worked last time. Oh, there, there. we are. How's Wait. that? No. Yes. Yes. Nice. Yes. Okay. Perfect. 
All right, so these, these are just two examples of pieces where the material, I really just picked it for the, the texture and the color, but because of what they communicate, not because I like blue. So the one on the left, drinking from a fire hose, that's all about how precipitation is going to change in as climate change uh, progresses. And so the blue section is all about how there's going to be more, more flooding, and the reddish section is how there's going to be more drought. And so those materials really, they're just there to kind of evoke that feeling of like wetness and, and uh, aridity, Ar aridness, God, no. Anyway, <laughs> and then on the other side, inches from famine, it's all about um, soil degradation. And so the top band is really the color, it maybe doesn't come through quite as much in this picture, but it's a really rich brown and it's a very shiny kind of smooth stone, um, really meant to evoke that, that richness of a topsoil. And then as you move down, you get into these like chunky, kind of very textured, dry looking, pieces of brick and terracotta and so um, the materials themselves are not really about soil but they're helping to tell that story so am i back you're back mm -hmm. excellent <laughs> um so so that's one way that i kind of think about it more often than not or where i where I get a lot of joy is when I use materials for what they mean. And so sometimes that's symbolic. Um, I tend to use a lot of coal and shale uh, to talk about either to stand in for kind of greenhouse gas emissions or for the fossil fuel industry. Um, I've used layers of graffiti paint to talk about um, communication because each layer of that paint is an artist trying to say something, right? So sometimes it's quite symbolic. Other times it's pretty on the nose and and a little bit um i don't know i get a kick out of doing it so you know using things like shells to talk about ocean acidification or bones to talk about eating meat or boots to talk about um, active transportation um i've used a ceramic loon to talk about mass extinction and it just like every piece just kind of uh so so when i do that I'm really doing it so that people can have something familiar and that they can connect with it. And it serves as a bit of an entryway into my work uh, because climate change and the Anthropocene, these are like big, messy, complicated, abstract issues. And so if you can give someone something like a loon, uh -huh. then it's just that little, a little hint that, okay, this is okay. I can maybe start trying to figure out what this is about rather than something completely, completely abstract because my compositions tend to be abstract. So the, the materials have to help a little bit. Um, so I've, I'll show you two examples of... There we go. You're still on drinking from the fire, uh, there you go. Yeah, don't worry, I'm getting there. <laughs> there, all right. So yeah, uh, so here's two of those examples. The on the left pollen's rule it's all about eating meat and the effect that ha that has on your carbon footprint so i actually used bones that were sourced from the lunches of meat eating friends and you can see they're surrounded by shale there again there's that use of shale kind of standing in for greenhouse gas emissions and then on the right hand side that's a piece that i made about walking basically active transportation and it's made out of two pairs of my boots um, so stop that again. <laughs> yeah, so so I tend to, so it's a mix. It's, you know, what what's chosen for its meaning, what's chosen for its color, what's chosen for its texture, and they all kind of intersect and they complement each other. And so if I'm if I'm using one of those materials that's kind of like a star material, like the the bones or the boots. Um, I usually just have one of those and then I try to mix that in with more traditional materials to kind of give your, your brain a little bit of a chance to rest and be able to fo focus on those kind of pockets of novelty and meaning. Um, that doesn't mean that the background materials aren't chosen with intent, they absolutely are. And so, hey, sorry. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and that that's amazing. Material. Rest when you're. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> All right. Back to showing more pictures. Sorry. One Sorry. more. 
Oh, Wait, sorry, oh yeah, no, go. I want to see because you're going to get to spam and Budweiser, right? I'm not. Oh, ah. you're not. No, I just know how much you like them. I didn't want to <laughs> give you what you wanted. So, so, so here's just an example of that that star material, that broken ceramic loon, and then it's set against just a very a very calm background, and it's made out of asphalt, right? So that that material was not just oh, I just need a plain gray background. It's asphalt because of like the land use and the land destruction and our the city's encroachment on those wild lands that's really affecting the wildlife. So it's chosen with a purpose, but it, there's that contrast mm. to that star material. Love All right, it. so um, I think the only other thing that I would say about that is, so something that I do, but I know it's not true for everyone, um, and I love that it's not true for everyone is I don't use a material just because I like it. Um, I have so many amazing materials just waiting on my shelf, just begging to be used. And I know like, the, and I'm super patient. They will sit there for sometimes years. And I know that when that right project finally comes along, yeah. it will be so much better because I haven't forced the use of something I love in another project, like shoehorned it in there just to, just cause I really, really want to get my hands on it. So um, yeah, patience. Well, your patience is one of the reasons you're here because you are one of the masters of using so many different kinds of materials, but you do tell an incredible story, each of you do. And again, couldn't be happier to have the three of you here for that reason. And before we move on to Caitlin, I do wanna say that please feel free to leave comments and questions in our live chat. The three of us, four of us cannot see that, but it's being monitored um, by Jerry. So he will um, let us know if there's anything that we can address now or if we're gonna do a follow-up after. So don't be hesitant to leave comments where you're from, say hello and um, any questions. So I really feel like we're gonna continue this conversation after we ask Caitlin's question, because there's just so much going on here about the materials and really you guys are kind of introducing how you use them and how important they are for why, but We'll keep this conversation going. So Caitlin, here's your question. You use a diverse selection of materials in your mosaics, ranging from traditional materials, such as smalty and marble, to found objects and salvaged items. What importance do you place on the manipulation of these materials prior to their in integration within a mosaic? And tell us where you're from. Okay, thanks so much, Tammy. So I'm Caitlin Hepworth and I'm coming to you from down under. I live in the Blue Mountains in New South Wales, Australia, about an hour west of Sydney. Uh, I have been um, working in visual arts pretty much my whole life. I, my previous training was as a sculptor and after my training in sculpture, I went on to pursue a visual arts education career and I was a visual arts teacher for about 10 years. Um, I've, I came to Mosaics about 20 years ago and have been working on and off in Mosaics ever since. And about 10 years ago, I abandoned my visual arts education career to start my school, Hughes Studio, where I teach visual arts and Mosaics to adults and children. So because I've come from a visual arts background, as opposed to going straight into mosaics, I bring that uh, kind of perspective with me at all times. So really when I think about creating a work, the first thing is what is it that you want to say? What is it? What's the story? What's the narrative? That's primary, always, always, always. Okay, so what do I want to say? All right, next thing, how am I going to say it? And then what materials do I need to use to tell that story? Now, so it kind of comes in two ways. So sometimes I might be driven by the material itself. I might have an opportunity to work with a particular material, which then tells a story and I have to manipulate it in a certain way to get that story out. Conversely, sometimes I start with the story and then I pick what materials I need to tell it. So in terms of the manipulation of the material, it really, really depends on what the story is. There is no one way. There is no one rule. There is no, it always must be like this. That every single thing I do is very, very different. And I'm going to show you some examples in a minute. But on the essence of manipulation, when, when we are mosaic artists, the, the primary thing we think of is the breaking. And the breaking of our material is something that is really, really intrinsic to what we do. And I think most people who work in mosaics for any length of time 
will actually come to understand that there's a there's an energetic transfer that goes on when you cut your material so uh, I'm using a hammer and hardy I'm using nippers I'm scoring and snapping uh, whatever it is I'm chipping I'm filing uh, when when I act upon the material I'm transferring some of myself to it there's a there's a there's an imprint that goes on there so when I take something that is uncut and I place it in whole like it doesn't have the same sort of uh, energy uh, or spirit that if, if I have manipulated the material in some way um, so I've got some slides to share with you that exemplify four different approaches to my manipulation and they are very different approaches uh, okay, so I'm going to now do the slide share. <laughs> Everyone holds their breath. Yeah. Hold your breath. Stand by. <laughs> oh, I feel so much better. <laughs> <laughs> Is it working? We still see you. But your internet's a little slow right now, but we're still seeing you. That's unfortunate. Should we sing? Okay. So, okay. Well, yeah. what I'm going to do is I'm just going to talk uh, about that. I mean, I, I guess I could just move my camera or I could just talk. What would you prefer, Tammy? Well, you can say what? She could send it to you. Can you email them quickly while we talk? I don't know. All right. Well, I'll, I'll try that. And um, if you guys talk, I'll just focus on that for a few seconds, and then I'll come Kelly, back to you. Okay. If you got you want to work on that for a second, we have some time. Kelly, why don't you talk a little bit about the piece that's right behind you? Um, can you just kind of, yeah, describe a little bit about how, because it, it always mesmerizes me how I will see you every, you know, six to eight months and you have come up with some new material. You are literally manipulating epoxy sculpt or whatever it is that no one would think like, yes, do that or put some rub and buff on something and do that. And so what's going on back there? Um, well, like, this is totally not rehearsed, everyone. Ha -ha. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, you know, it's this is this is my lockdown series, like the one that's directly behind me, the gray one. Um, mm -hmm. That's about uh, impetus, what it takes to disturb the order, of, and what are the ripples of change that that ripple through the impact that ripples through the order. Um, so I'm I'm super abstract, man. I'm just like I'm not going to be making no coronaviruses, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna be all like, okay, what am I thinking? Um, so this one is kind of along the same vein. It's a little bit more straightforward because it's about, you know, con confine and, you know, what trans what transfers between two, what between two um, beings, you know, between two parties. And again, the disturbance of the interjection of those into the order. And um, it all, it started actually, the reason why I chose this palette, it could have been any palette, it could have been any, really, the colors and the materials um, the design is it. And then the colors and materials could have been many different things. Just high contrast is what I wanted. But I had some bronze materials that I really, I've been, I've been collecting brown bronze stuff for years and using it here and there in pieces. But I, I just really haven't had a, um, had a piece where I could just like go nuts on the, the brown bronze. And, and that's what this piece is. And so it's just all about exploring one color palette and using every material and not just bronzy things, but like the cut clay body of ceramic. And I describe how to do this in Kick-Ass Yet, of course. Uh, the cut clay body of ceramic, the ceramic clay sides are, are white, but the clay body's white and I can color that brown and bronze and use it up on its edge and get a different texture, a different read of tessera, you know, so. For me, it's so much about the materials because once I've decided on the design, I want to get into the texture of the materials and make them do, I, I basically make them do all kinds of things they weren't intended to do when they walked in the room. <laughs> so yeah, I'm all about that. I've just recently begun faceting uh, stained glass, which is a bit of a trick because it's so thin. 
but holy crow, is that satisfying. Um, anyway, so that's just a little bit about that. And you see, if you, you can't really see because we're a little far away from it, but the blue is kind of the, um, what, what transmits between those two white, um, you know, individuals? What's the, what's the transmission that's going on between those? I like it. So. Caitlin, how are we doing? Oh, now oh we have a sound. Say it again. I sent it to you, Gmail, but um, there you go. Uh, we'll see if that comes through. Um, okay. We're having just a few internet connection issues here, but um, it's it's still lovely to be here. So I can just continue to talk about it, I guess. Um, yes. yes, and you know what we right. can do is we can probably get the pictures up into the comment section later mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll make this work. But go on, because you do have yeah. a lot of information okay. to share. All right, so the first image I want to yeah. share was an image of my mural. So some people may have seen that. So it's a very, very large scale mural. It's a six by three meter mural in a in a restaurant in Canberra. So this is a public uh, place. It's a, It was a commission. So when I'm doing something like that, my um, my aim is not necessarily to spend a lot of time being artistic with every piece. You know, there's, you know, 200 kilos of product there. I need to get that on the wall. I need to get it up quickly. I, my focus is being on technically sound and to create a beautiful design and to fulfill the client brief. But it's not really about me manipulating and being um, very expressive personally. Uh, perhaps though, when I work on my sculptural forms, I, I take much more care with my manipulation. So, in that in that aspect, I might be faceting uh, small tea, I might be faceting pizza, I might be bringing in all kinds of natural materials such as uh, stone. I use a lot of slate, I use a lot of sandstone, I use a lot of marble, and I bring those together in a way to try to create energetic connections between the actual mosaic and the form. So the sculptural form and the application of the mosaic need to link together. Uh, so, and the other thing then I do is often I work with fossic materials and salvage materials. So as you know, um, unfortunately, we were very badly impacted here in Australia by bushfires more recently, but also a number of years ago, six years ago, um, lost my home and uh, studio and uh, businesses to um, to bushfire. So that was a pretty traumatic event overall for everybody in the whole community. But one thing I was able to do was, um, as an artist, I was actually able to use, to use my mosaic to process the trauma of what happened. So I spent days and days and days taking buckets and buckets and buckets of material out of sight. So what I got is I got my crockery, my china, I got glass that had mushed together, I got jewellery that had fallen in my house and, again, bound together into interesting clumps and there was melted metal, melted glass, um, old sculptures and then a lot of old mosaics as well. I had a lot of mosaics in my house and I was able to use uh, those fragments, the skeletons of that. So I took that, I took the um, glass off the inside of those burnt mosaics and then I have used those to make new work. And in a way, the fire itself has transformed. It, it's kind of gone in a weird circle. Someone's made the glass. I've taken the glass and made it into a sculptural mosaic. The fire has then remelted the glass. Then I've taken the glass again and then I've made it into another mosaic. And there's a whole kind of chain reaction and process there. Um, in, in sort of hands of different makers and sculptural forms and fire and me and then that, and it helps me to process what I'm doing. So really in that essence, I'm trying to tell a story, I'm trying to process uh, something that's happened to me and I'm doing that through the use of that salvage material. When um, the, 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 another really interesting work I did want to show you and I hopefully we'll get these photos up later, but um, I, I work in a beautiful uh, historic building called the Woodford Academy. Now it's a National Trust property and it was um, a, a stopping point on the way to the gold field. So travellers would stop there, they would camp there, juice their horses, eat and drink, and they would leave their rubbish. And, and in that point in time, their rubbish was actually glass or ceramic or alabaster. So outside my studio in the ground, there's tons and tons and tons and tons of people's rubbish. And I've been fortunate enough to start using some of that. Now, that's all protected. I cannot cut anything. I cannot glue anything. I cannot do anything permanent. But I've been able to take those materials, 
look at them, touch them, and then um, with some respect, a lot of respect and honour for, for those people before, assemble them into an installation, which I presented in the bakery of the Woodford Academy. Um, so some people say, well, that's actually not a mosaic. Is it ceramics? Is it installation? Is it sculpture? Is it mosaic? Because there were three-dimensional elements and flat elements and there was walk-around installation elements. None of that matters. I don't care whether you think it's a mosaic or not. It's an artwork, really. It's primarily, first and foremost, an artwork yep. that pays homage and respects people and places and pottery and, and objects and functionality and design and spirit. And it is all really tied together. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how I go about it. Four very different approaches. Yeah. Wow. Mm. Wow. So um, I'd like to, to also just point out how how I really think there is no one way about this. I think, you know, in this panel, we've got three different artists and um, we've all come from different backgrounds. We've all got different training. We've all had different careers. And each person manages to bring their own thing to the table in terms of what they do with materials. And I think when people start learning, they want to know, how do I do it? What is the one way to do this mosaic? <laughs> There's no one way. That just doesn't work like that. Yeah. Yes, there are some things we can learn about. You know, this is glass and this is smelting and this is marble and this is porcelain and this is, and these are how, these are some basic techniques. And I know, you know, Kelly, for example, has some beautiful uh, ways and methods of, of, of using her materials, as does Julie, and I do, as do I. But my point is that there's not one way to do that. You really have to, um, open yourself up once you know how to do it technically you need to open yourself up to what material can i use why can i use it and what does it mean yeah but if we were to if if, if i were to say there's a one-way thing <laughs> yeah. if there's one thing i would say that makes every material work better in every mosaic ever it's use mortar as the adhesive <laughs> yeah <laughs> because mortar is the only adhesive in which you can embed tesserae and tip them and, and give them sculptural merit. No other adhesive works that way. So for me, it's vital to, to using these materials in any mosaic that I do. The fact that I'm setting these materials into mortar and I can get them to, to nestle and and you know move together in different ways and apart from one another just between one piece and the next and i can't do that in any other in any other um adhesive so if there was one thing i would say that you know is super important that maximizes any and every material you're going to use it's mortar and it can be tinted to any color and again we talk about this in kick ass yet but it's not it, it's across any type of material uh, or style that you're working in, um, except for glass on glass, of course. But um, well, and th that's one of the things that you know, maybe someone that's a beginner just getting to know the three of your works is yeah. that none of you use grout, and right. because you don't have to, because you've used the tinted mortar and you are manipulating the different ways that they are being placed and right. doing that. So height differentials, major height differentials, all of that stuff you can do in mortar that you can't do in any other adhesive. And of course, in again, in functional, Caitlin knows this, Julie, um, in functional mosaics, architectural mosaics, exterior, um, you know, buildings, that kind of a thing. Of course, we're going to grout it. We're going to, you know, so it can be cleaned. And if you want simplicity and cleanability and all that stuff, then yeah, there's going to be grout. So you go back and forth. You, you, I'm not saying no grout bad, you know, but, um, but for the most part, if I have my druthers, if I'm expressing myself in mosaic, it's mortar. It's mortar and every and any material I can get my hands on. And I'm going to make that material, each material into 17 different materials. And, <laughs> you know. Okay. So a couple of things. Um, we did get the slides. So we are going to go over Caitlin's slides. <laughs> uh, Kelly, why don't you quickly share what, or all three of you share your favorite mortars that you like to use. And this isn't because it's a plug to um, the companies. It's more because people do ask a lot what they think is the best ones. And some are better for sticking to stone than they are to glass. What tints better, what has certain textures, what's not so good for um, Tessera. So 
give us, and I know Caitlin can share because she has different names and different kinds of products down in Australia. And we do have a huge Australia following. Thank all of you and New Zealand. Yeah. So, um, so quickly, can you guys share that? And then, um, and then Caitlin will go over your slides. I'm a MAPE girl. Um, for the last many years, I've been using MAPE ever since using it in Italy and in Australia. Um, I have come to just swear by it. I, I love the P10 um, with the Careply additive. So it's, it is unbelievably strong. Aus my Australian students, my first year there in 2016, schooled me on that. <laughs> uh, I'm all like, oh no, you gotta be careful not to put in these big materials with just with mortar if you're not gonna grow. And they're like, okay. uh, yeah, I don't think you have to worry about that with what we're using. I'm like, oh, no, you do. I'm the teacher. And they're like, Vicki Bush is like, yeah, no, no, I don't think you need to worry about it. And then I mix it up and I'm like, holy wow, this stuff is amazing. So so yeah, Matt Pay for me all the way. Um, Laticrete's great too. Um, but for the most part, I'm um, I'm a mappe girl, and mostly, or very often in the studio, um, when I've already, when I know what I'm doing and I'm I'm working pretty quickly, I use Rapid Set, um, so that it it um, it hardens up. I mean, it's done really quickly, and I'm I'm done with that area, and it firms up, and I can just go right on to the next. Um, but uh, P10 and Careplay Additive, yeah, that's that's my jam. And Julie, uh, I'm a Laticrete 255 girl. <laughs> and what just else? it's just a um that's what I started using what I got you know kind of used to creature of habit um it's just kind of a good all-rounder so yeah yeah um and then and do you don't use an additive and 255 is good because it's for stone it's not yeah. necessarily ne necessary like 254 is better for glass yeah so I don't tend mortar, to use a lot of glass any yeah. mortar that you use every manufacturer has, you know, there's several, several, they have whole lines of these, you know, for different things and call your manufacturers, call them and ask them. They've got technical people waiting for somebody to call them and nerd out about the technical specs of this stuff. So call them and ask them, hey, I'm doing a firebox or I'm doing a this or that and get it straight from the horse's mouth because we're all yeah. going to be doing different things and using it different ways. So go right to the people who built it, who tested it, you know, find out what's best for your application. Okay, and we're going to get more into that in a little bit, but I'm going to be the brave one because I haven't rehearsed this, but I think I can get Caitlin's. Um, <laughs> okay. So hold on one. Uh, wait, cool. wait for it. Wait for it. Nope, that's da, da, not da, da, it. Da, 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 that is da, 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 not it, honey. What happened? You said Alt Tab, and now I don't have a share screen option. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not in Jitsi. I'm, like, I'm at Jitsi, but now I don't have it a show. It was all going so well. Window. Oh, there it is. At least it wasn't me. <laughs> what do you guys see? Slides. Mural, yeah. Okay. Do you see all four of us, though? Or just yeah. the slides? I can see the slide. Only the slide? And I can see you on the side. Okay. Perfect. It's perfect now. What do you see? That's what you want. I see Caitlin's face. Yeah, I see I everybody see the and the slide. It okay. I can't toggle them though, Jerry. You have the slides. Okay, I have the slides. So yeah, go. Yeah, looks great. Do I alt tab back to the slides now? No. That's an awesome mural, Caitlin. Okay, go on about the mural, Caitlin. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, in this slide, if you can see it, we've got the mural. So on the left-hand side, there's two um, smaller pictures which give you this sort of sense of scale of the whole thing. As I said, it's six by three metres, and then in the middle of that mural, there's a big window with a sort of view to the, the – that's actually the kitchen servery. And then what I've done is in the middle picture, I've zoomed in a bit so that you can see – uh, the undermento and that you can see that the fact that most of those pieces there are uncut. Now, when you're making something huge and functional like that, you just don't have the time to be sitting there chopping every little piece into little, even little pieces. <laughs> and then in the, in the, on the right hand side image, you can see the pelican. I'm not sure how well you can see that, but you can see the whole pieces. But what you can also see is how many different materials are in there. So in that particular section where the pelican is, we've got Italian smalty, Mexican smalty, slate, travertine, marble. Uh, we've got um, different types of stone. We have got vitreous glass. We've got unglazed uh, ceramic. And it's all in there together. And there's a huge variation in colour and texture. 
but predominantly the materials have not been mucked around with too much. They're placed in as they are to be functional and to get the job done well, to be color, you know, to make the color blending effective and uh, to, to, to move on with such a large project. So there's fairly minimal manipulation of the materials in that project. Now, if you want to look at all those photos further, you can actually go to my website and you can actually scroll through and see the details. Tammy, can you move to the next slide for me? I'm going to try. I think I can. Okay, wait, wait for it. Do you see, is it coming? It's coming. Yeah. There, there it is. There it is. Okay. okay, so this is my second example. And as you can see, it's very, very different to the first one. Uh, and this is from a series, Weapons of the Mind. And um, there were a series of seven uh, small wall hanging relief uh, pieces. And um, it's about inner battle. So this one is actually titled Self-Sabotage. So other titles were things like rumination, catastrophic thinking, uh, twisted truths, uh, old wounds and rumination. Uh, and it sort of reflects some of the dark places in our mind that we all go to, but it's also a bit of a humorous look at it. But again, here, the materials used are quite diverse. So there's a lot of slate that I've been able to put in dimensionally, in, as Kelly was talking about earlier, into the mortar so that there's a real kind of feathering of the slate as it comes down the tip of that of that um, spear. Then I've got other more traditional materials such as smalty and unglazed ceramic, as well as using chunks of slate for the handle of the weapon. I was trying to get the idea of these little old psychological weapons and using chunks of stone felt right on the handle there. So it's sort of different type of manipulation. Can you move on in the, in the next yep. slide? Coming to the next one. There we go. Nice. Okay, so this is an example of using fire salvage materials. So on the left-hand side, you, there is a sculpture called Spirit Fire, and I made that in 2012. So it was actually about fire, but it wasn't, I had no idea what was about to come and destroy my life, which is kind of <laughs> ironic. So I kind of maybe brought it on myself. So there is Spirit Fire <laughs> sculpture. So then in the little top, top middle image, you can see that same sculpture the day after the bushfire and you can see all that beautiful red smalty and the inside of the sculpture has sort of run down the substrate and pulled and gone into chunks inside that. So what I did is I scraped all that off and then I made uh, that this um, small piece and many others called Pulse of Spirit Fire. So what I did is use all those melted glass pieces from that sculpture to make this uh, 2D work which is reminiscent of a heartbeat and the, the, the life and the energy that we have as humans, that we have as a community and, you know, that the sculpture had and the material has and, and I integrated that with some, some new material as well. But you can see how gnarled and fragile some of those pieces look. And to the final slide, please, uh, Tammy. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Tammy. So this final slide is the uh, the shot of the installation that I was talking about. So this is directly beneath my studio. This is the old bakery, uh, the Woodford Academy. And you can see on the top left hand side, there's a full shot of the installation, which was it was called a shared table and it was meant to represent the, the styles and the people that have been before. So we have the servants quarters, the eating area. We have the gentlemen and the bar and then we have the ladies in the parlour on the on the other side. So. Um, it was quite dimensional, every single thing there, other than the chinka that you can see, which indicates, suggests tablecloths. Everything there was exhumed. So there was um, bottles, alabaster jars, uh, all sorts of forks, bits of cups and rims and things like that. Kelly would have gone crazy, but you were not allowed to touch or cut them. And then in the right-hand side image, you can see a zoomed in area of that um, first plinth there and and what I what I wanted to show you here is that I've been able to make a mosaic and make an artwork without actually manipulating the material at all I have used it exactly as it was found didn't wash it didn't cut it didn't glue it just placed it I did use a bit of blue tack occasionally, so things didn't move around too much. But all those pieces then had to go back into, into the collection once I had finished the installation. Wow. So I um, thank you. And I'm sorry there was a delay on getting those slides to you, everybody. But, um, you know, versatile and we got there in the end. Thank you so much, Tammy. No, I mean, you are so fast. So that was awesome. So, yeah, we do apologize for a little bit of a glitch, but we are all back um, now. And um, Caitlin, since we are talking about your work, can you talk a little bit about the piece right behind you as well? 
Um, you know, this, uh, this piece here is by Peace Anastasis and I'm very, very happy to share that I've just sold it. <laughs> so yay. Congratulations. Okay. Uh, this is off to Canberra to um, and it's a new home once I'm actually allowed to drive there and not get arrested. Um, so this is uh, one of very, very many pieces I did um, in relation to the bushfire and it's inspired by the slice of a burnt tree. So on this side, we have the, the power of regeneration that comes from nature, comes from energy, comes from, from, from the centre. So there's a goal coming out and then we've got a, a green fading out to it, to a, a black burnt rim. Now, I'm not going to move it because it's over 20 kilos and I'll kill myself. No, um, no, but no, no. on the other side is um, the ashen grey. So it's a sculptural form. So inside the form is built of steel mesh and uh, fibre mesh and thin set. And then it's been... Um, it's slathered with waterproofer and then the tessera have been put on um, with Carabon to nice elastic back on adhesives. I'm a MAPE girl as well. Uh, Carabon to nice elastic or Caraflex Maxi and a little bit of laticrete and also P10. Um, my comments on the, the adhesive question, I think, are also, like Kelly said, go to the source. I have a relationship with my tiling shop. I have a I have a person there. He's a tech head. He knows everything. I go to him and I ask him and I do what he says because he knows better than me. Okay, but I'm a map girl, and this is Carabon to nice elastic and he's and that and that piece is on your website as well. Correct. Correct. Yeah, so if you want to visit any of these three artists and look at their work more detailed, they do have three uh, fabulous websites. So you can visit their work there if you can. I'll probably also email them if you have a question or two. But we are now going to move on to our round two of a little bit more processy questions. And this one goes to you, Kelly. This is, do you create a practice sample piece or test new materials? And if so, what are some of the properties, issues you're looking for or solving? And how much time do you spend on a practice piece? Um, yes, I, I often do. I don't always to explore a new material, but I often do. Um, so I'll show you a couple of ways that I tackle this. Um, I'll, I'll, okay, now it's my turn to do the share screen again. Wish me luck. Application window, alt tab. Yes. Uh, no, application window. Okay, PowerPoint slideshow. Stay with me. Yeah, baby. Okay, next, yeah. Uh, so um, on the right, you have a, a, a material that I was just playing with to see. It's a uh, Zenza by, um, it's Mexican Smalti. Um, and so I was just playing with it to see um, what it, uh, how it faceted, how does it tip, how does it, um, it's got a matte finish. So I wanted to see what does it look like when the matte finish is removed. Um, so I'm playing with it and I want to see, I want to cut it with every tool I've got and I want to see how it cuts. I want to see how it lays into mortar. I want to see how many ways can I cut it? What is it, what it's, what is it, it's inside reveal to me. Um, so what are all the ways that this material can speak? So even if I don't do a, um, a practice board like this, I will do usually a, um, did I say on the left, it's on the right. Um, so right. even if I don't do a practice board like this, I will take the material and spend 20 minutes or so just cutting it with every uh, tool that I have just to see how it cuts. Uh, does it tend to cut off on an angle? Does it cut straight? Does it crumble? Um, all of those things because I want to know how I can manipulate it. I don't want to be surprised by that when I'm starting on a mosaic. Um, I don't want to be figuring that out and fumbling through that as I'm creating. I want to know that beforehand. So I definitely will test. Now the other slide is um, it shows the current it shows the initial palette I was putting together for this piece that's behind me the bronze the brown bronze uh, piece about transmission and um, not all those materials made it in and some of the extra materials uh, there are some materials that aren't on that aren't in that uh, palette but what I want to point out is the stick that is on the top of that uh, bowl. And it's right here in the studio, and I call it my palette stick. Um, I, I don't like to, I don't want to beat you with it, but um, it's super effective, especially if I am going to um, be working in a tinted mortar. I want to know what every single one of those materials looks like in that mortar um, and how they look next to one another and that sort of thing. So, um, so a palette stick, I love that. And uh, as you could see, it was sitting 
up on the um, it was sitting up on the easel with the piece so that I could um, kind of come back to you. Um, it's sitting up on the easel with me as I work because I want to know, okay, so I'm going to use this material next. Um, how did that sort of present in the mortar? And do I want to use that next or do I want to use a different one? So um, Viva La Palette Stick. But yes, testing, sampling. Oh, heck, I'm not going to swear. Look at me, a whole hour, I'm not swearing. Um, <laughs> hurt everywhere. Sure how that's happening. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, palette stick, testing, sampling all the time with materials, testing everything. And even, I wanted to mention, even um, in my um, Radical Dimensions uh, uh, course that is on Mosaic Arts Online. The whole thing that started that um, was trying to figure out different ways to use stained glass, not flat. So mm -hmm. up on its edge, using the back, the front, the cut edge, you know, building with it architecturally because I wanted it to do something different than it usually had always done. So yeah. exploration always with the materials. Yeah. Blah, blah. Yeah. Couldn't agree more and uh, it's super important. So Julie, Mm -hmm. Do you think about the environmental impact on any of your materials? Um, environmental. What yeah. a weird question to ask Julie. I know it's super <laughs> out of left field there. Um, I would I would say yes and no. Um, no, in that, like I don't think about the carbon footprint of you know, like I intuitively know that glass made in Italy and shipped all the way to Canada is going to have a bigger carbon footprint than a stone that I find in my backyard. I don't choose my materials based on that. I'm not going to not use glass from Italy just because that. I'll probably use it because I don't like glass. Um, <laughs> so, but but I do think of the environmental impact in terms of I in terms of the way I use my materials. So I, I try to really respect them and not waste them. Um, I do tend to use a lot of trash uh, or repurposed items. Uh, you know, one of the things that I have started doing in the last little while is, you know, if I've got extra thin set at the end of a work session, then I, I kind of spread that out and make some some new material out of it uh, and then incorporate that into future pieces. And that's one of the things that I do teach here on MAO. Um, and then when I'm out kind of harvesting or foraging, I, I try not to over harvest from an area. Like I, I try to be very, thoughtful that way. Um, I absolutely do not go into protected areas and <laughs> forage there. Um, and also I've stopped using or picking up shells from beaches. Um, I know there's some ecological ramifications with that. So if people have given them to me because they've picked them up while on vacation, then I will still use them um, because <laughs> the damage is done. <laughs> but I myself will not contribute. Nice to know to where that. your line is, Julie. <laughs> you gotta have a line somewhere. <laughs> so, so yeah, it the way I think about my materials, like my environmental ethic informs the way I use my materials and then my materials inform the way I talk about environmental issues. So it's very much circular. Yes, we, we we didn't hesitate when that question came up. <laughs> going to. And if you haven't visited Julie's site or followed her on social media, check it out. She's got an amazing blog that comes out. I don't want to commit you, honey, once a month, maybe, if we're lucky. <laughs> yeah, not recently, but yes, it, when, I'm, when I'm in the studio, <laughs> yes. yes. Um, Caitlin, Given the fact that I, this is coming from a student, I love rusty old and found metal items. What look, what would you recommend doing to rusty metal pieces prior to using it as tessera? Okay, so I love the uh, using pieces of rusty metal. I was able to integrate rusty nails, bolts and all sorts of things into a range of my work. Um, but the, the main thing we want is we don't want it to fall out. We don't want it to fall off. We want it to have some longevity. Uh, so the, the first thing you need to do is you need to remove any loose flakes of rust because if you stick that on as it is, really your adhesive is sticking to the flakes and as soon as those flakes come away, the inside piece will fall out of the mosaic. So using a wire brush, a very stiff brush, give it a good old rough up and a bit of a sand to get the, any flakes off, off the metal. Um, the second thing you need to do is actually stop the rust from recurring. So you need to get a product from your hardware store. For here it's just called Rust Stop. And you, you need to just paint that on to, to stop the rusting process continuing so that it's not going to rust further once it's been put in the mosaic. 
after that i would probably seal the the, the metal in some way depending on what it is and what sort of sealers you have available and then you need to adhere it to the mosaic with an adhesive that is rated for metal which means you need to read the instructions you need to read the specs the technical specification sheet does it say metal or no if it says no metal don't don't do it um again go to your tech tech boffin and ask the question or just read through the different adhesives and which ones work with metal and which ones don't and there are a lot of them that do i'm not going to recommend one because i'm in sydney australia and that's not going to help you if you're in canada or wherever um but yeah the, the, i think it's great to include these things but as sort of links back to um kelly's first question about the durability and how how you might sort of manipulate that material what you might do to it before you put it into the mosaic so it's a, it's a linked question so thank you tammy yeah, no. Um, it, it, the thing about what you guys do that is so important is not just that you're using these conventional materials. And like we started this whole conversation with Kelly talking about durability and ephemeral mostly, is that you guys are all still coming from a place of utter integrity. And that is so important as artists that you're using Am I crazy? No, right? <laughs> I, I utter, I, I mean, utter is a little, you know, maybe. Well, okay. I've been known to cut a corner. Literal. <laughs> <laughs> Don't put us on pedestal. <laughs> no utter, no utter integrity, just integrity, just. Integrity, yeah, integrity. Integrity. You guys really do put a lot of integrity in the, in not just the materials that you're using, but just your creations and what goes behind everything you're doing. You guys don't just pop in your studio and start slapping stuff to stuff. And that's why you're here because you're here to really give people a little more insight into your whole process and really sharing what you do. And, you know, like I said in the beginning, each of your courses is so different, but really comes from that place of using materials in a way that can make you think outside the box, but still make things that are not going to fall apart two days later because you put With some intent. It's all about intent. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all about intent. Yeah. And, um, I, you know, I can't thank you guys enough for coming here and really sharing this information with us. And because you've stayed till the end, all you lovely students and people that love Mosaic Arts Online and we love you, we have a little gift for you once again. And these are their three courses. And for uh, about 30 hours or less, somewhere in there, you get a discount off of each of their courses for 15% off, which we Yay. never offer. And so those will be in the comment section and will be shared with you. But if you catch that there, that's how you put the coupon codes in. So you make sure you put the dash and make sure you spell Kelly with an E and um, eight, Caitlin with an I and uh, put your dash 15. But is there anything else you guys wanted to add um, into this conversation? I'm sure people might want to hang out a few more minutes. Yes, ma'am, with the hand up. I have just one thing that I would say, and I, well, it partly goes back to what Caitlin was saying um, earlier. I think if I were to give one piece, maybe two pieces of advice, uh, just be, just keep being curious and fearless with your materials. Yeah. Um, explore, explore, explore. Don't worry about messing up. Uh, something that Kelly taught me is like, there are no sacred materials. Um, and, and it will serve you well in the long run to just keep messing around and also don't worry if you don't have all the tools you would be surprised how few tools i use <laughs> i cut a lot of different stuff and i i do a lot of it with just like some really basic bare bones tools if you find a material and you know, love it obviously set yourself up with a good tool so you're not going to hurt yourself long run but you don't have to have the brand spank a new top of the line whatever just to cut this one thing that you might not ever cut again so just yeah, that would, that would be yeah on that, I mosaic for about 12 years with a pair of straight nose nippers from mm -hmm. my local hardware store, which cost about 10 bucks. I didn't uh, ever have, and, and then when I got some leopardets, I'm like, oh, wow. And then I've got modulin. But, you know, honestly, 12 years, the bottom of the barrel, crappiest nippers you have. But you know what? They worked and it was that was fine so good good point joy so one thing i would say um I, the following the curiosity thing always be curious always ask what else your materials can do 
Don't settle for them just as they are. As Caitlin says, put your impact on them. Impact them with your selfness, your creativity, and make them yours. Um, the other thing is what I'm always learning uh, is less is more. And that um, asking a mosaic to uh, to do 25 things to accommodate, you know, 25 different materials um, is is hard. And um, better to ask your mosaic to do a couple things well. Like Julie, she's telling a story. Three materials can do that, and she does that. She doesn't, you know, slap in a bunch of extraneous stuff just because she likes it. Um, because there will always be another mosaic for that to go into. So intent that comes back to then intent. You know, be intentional about anything that comes in. For me, it's color has to be really, really intentional because um, it's to me, it's so loud. Color is so, so loud. So for me, it has to be really intentional. It has to, there's a colored material in there, like in this guy, the turquoise. Oh boy, that's about as much color as I can. <laughs> hey, that's, ah, that's high day, you know, what I'm putting in the turquoise. Um, yeah, yeah. Before you walk in the studio. <laughs> So intent, keep always work with intent. Keep your, um, when you use a material, do so with intent. And what story is it telling? How is it expressing what you want to express? And sometimes well, and the lack of material can be the best mm -hmm. material. Mm -hmm. I know oh, you, yeah. <laughs> Space. Hey, Lynn, yeah. what were you going to say? Yeah, I, on, on, on that, I just think um, a summary point that, that links with materials, but just in more broadly to what we're doing as artists. Yeah. I think more of us need to start thinking of ourselves as artists mm -hmm. and um, stop constantly thinking, well, is this a mosaic? Is this not a mosaic? Uh, does it, that doesn't actually matter, I don't think, um, because we're making art, right? Mm -hmm. So we're, we're working on an idea, How what is the idea? How are we gonna say it? And how are we gonna use the medium of mosaic? to communicate that and we not to put limitations on 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 your material choices or your conceptual choices or your the form that you're going to go with because tradition says it must be this or it must be that i mean i am a bit of a stickler for for mosaic language and having a knowledge about that and i teach a lot of that in my courses but once you have that knowledge uh you know don't box yourself in just let yourself be uh and i uh an artist that is expressing your idea through your chosen medium, which may be mosaic, maybe it won't be in, you know, either way. Yeah, is it art? That's, is it good art? You know, I, I, labels, labels can be helpful, but they're really not that necessary and they can be restrictive. So let's just make, let's just make art, let's just make good art. Uh, yeah, and I think you guys have given so much in this hour, so much information, and it's been so rich. And I will say, as an observer of all three of your art, um, Julie, especially when you, I saw your piece with the graffiti in San Diego, it was like, come on, you know, that to me is just going so far out of any comfort zone as a mosaic artist and becoming an artist and finding something. And Kelly seeing the paper towels and thinking, she's nuts. Are you kidding me? I'm a mosaic artist. You would never do that. And here we are talking about it because it is yeah. so important to express yourself that way and yeah. figure things out. And Caitlin, your work of melted glass after such a tragic event, I get goosebumps. So mm -hmm. you guys are truly just like the leaders, utter leaders in, <laughs> I just had to, um, in this, no, seriously, you guys really, um, no, stop. Uh, no, stop. Uh, Don't stop. <laughs> the example of what I'm looking for. <laughs> and I want you to share that as much as you can. So you guys came here and you did that and I can't be more grateful. And Caitlin coming all the way from Australia, we have technical difficulties all the time and we made it work. We made it, work. it was awesome. Really so good. I can't thank the three of you enough and I can't thank all of you who are safely staying home still. And we're gonna get through this together. We're gonna be together again. And just to give you a little bit of a tease, our next guest will be Marae Swinnon coming up. Yay! So for that, she's gonna have her own private presentation on Spill and Barrago and her tours through it. Wow. So subscribe to this channel if you have not. Go get your coupon on because it uh, expires tomorrow night at midnight. And that's it, honey. There was one more. <laughs>
Oh, yeah, oh and send, sorry, my producer over there. And send us your questions. You guys still can um, pop some questions in the chat. You can send them to us at Mosaic Arts Online. We will answer them for you. And yeah. again, I can't thank you all enough for being here and everyone staying hopefully healthy, well, and keep creating, keep, keep yeah. creating, experimenting, yeah. experimenting in your studio. Do it. Do it. So thank you. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, everyone. Guys. Thank you.